Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Out and About in the UK, coming to you today from the London Irish Centre here in Camden. Coming up a little later in the show, we'll be at the launch of a new CD box set compiled by Dr Reg Hall, which documents and commemorates the wealth of traditional Irish music talent that came to London over the past 60 years. And staying in the centre, we'll also be meeting artist Bernard Canavan to find out more about his life and the inspiration behind his work. But first, we're going to meet up with writer Dennis Carey, who has recently penned a historical story of the eviction of a young family in the west of Ireland. The book, An Untilled Field, is set in County Mayo in the lead-up to the land wars of the 1800s. The Bunch of Grapes public house on Narrow Street was a thin pub, with a rear terrace that drooped almost to the point of collapse into the River Thames. Peggy had been in London for the best part of two years, but the tall, slim building was the first public house she had ever entered. She strode through the door with two friends from work. Agnes grew up in County Mayo and Nora was only two years old when her family emigrated from County Cork. It was Nora's 40th birthday and the small group was out to celebrate. The narrow pub brimmed with loud, boorish people, stevedores and watermen amongst them, drinking and arguing with marketers and dredgermen. Nora looked for and received an odd permission to enter from the owner before he descended through a hole in the floor to the cellar. Peggy had thought entering a public house the most outrageous thing in the world to do, but London seemed to be like that, a city of the outrageous, permitting the single woman, should she wish, to live outside the modern Victorian conventions, not at all like Ennis back home in County Clare. Uh, the story kicks off in the 1870s. Um, it has two strands. Uh, one strand is where the, the two boys following their survival are following a, an eviction. Uh, and their parents are arrested and taken away. And then there's another strand where um, Bernie, as a, a Dublin man who um, came to London via Liverpool, and um, eventually the, the two of them meet up later on in the book. Liam then forms a plan. His plan is to uh, look after his brother, find his parents, and then come back to avenge the people that evicted him from, uh, from their, uh, their, their rented um, cottage. We then have the, the, the parents, which, uh, and I won't uh, spoil the story to say whether or not they actually meet up and how much of Liam's plan he, he actually um, realises. But um, the, the title, An Until Field, comes really from this, this concept of if, if you have a family who live off the land, which is what people were doing in those days, and Liam's father certainly did, he tilled the field lovingly year after year. Uh, that was his livelihood, that was their survival. When he was evicted then, if Liam, imagine coming back two or three years later to find that the land has just been left untilled, deserted. Uh, I just wanted to explore how um, a character might react to that. When people do reviews of the book, they tend to forget about Bernie, but he's an important character in the book. He's a bare knuckle fighter, but he likes a drink as well. And this pub happens to be the place where he meets uh, his woman in the, in the story, Peggy. Um, Peggy walks in one evening, and it says a lot about the Peggy character, the fact that she's brave enough to walk in. She walks in with two friends. They're, uh, they're celebrating uh, Nora's 40th birthday, so they come in, they ask for permission from the barman if it's okay to come in. And it's in here just around the corner, they're just from behind the, the staircase where Bernie meets her for the first time. It's a gritty story. Um, it, then it shifts between the, uh, the Bernie scene over here in London with, with Peggy, and then back to the west of Ireland then where the eviction happened with the two boys uh, and their survival. I'm not a historian, however, I do enjoy reading about Irish history. And I, when I'm looking for a story, I'm always looking for, for a story where there are periods of conflict, um, where there's some real fantastically interesting characters. And it was just when I was coming across the Irish land wars that I thought, here we've got a situation where there's some, some conflict. We've got the, the landlords are evicting the tenants. Um, the trauma that that's caused in that and so I was imagining a scene where we've got two young youngsters who are caught up in all of that and that's what really led on led on to the story it helps also that I was able to base it in Mayo because uh, originally I'm from Mayo so it's nice to be able to do some research around about my own my own county one of the joys of writing about it is it's an excuse to get back um, so I would, we were over there for two or three weeks uh, researching the book traveling around the route taken by the two boys um, and also the, um, the landlord who evicts them, looking at uh, their plot of land as well, which is in a place near Kincon, uh, farmhouse estate, is, uh, farm hill estate is what it's called. Um, 
It's placed near King Con, which is near Ballinar. Most people may know Ballinar in, in the west of Ireland. The next one may bring in Sligo, which is uh, broadening my horizons a little bit. Um, but I do, I do enjoy that, that aspect and um, the research that it brings and uh, just learning about the area uh, is, is you know, uh, quite enjoyable. Um, there, is a, there is a website, there is a, uh, a blog site if people do uh, look up Dennis Carey, but also if they look on Facebook as well, on social media. An Untilled Field has its own page on there if they want to look for that on Facebook and like it. And then they'll, they'll keep up to, uh, up to date with developments. And also on Twitter, you, I can, you can, people can follow me on Twitter as well. It's available online uh, to buy as a, as a download for uh, people who prefer the Kindle. And also download, uh, you can order a, a paper copy as well. Many thanks there to Dennis for inviting us along there to speak to him about his brand new book, An Until Field. County Longford artist Bernard Canavan recently held an exhibition here in the London Irish Centre. And we went along to find out more. How did you get involved in, in painting and, and the art world? Well, I, I didn't go to school much when I was a kid. I wasn't very well, and um, the, the schoolmaster was a fairly difficult man to get on with. And so I, I, my mother and him had a falling out, and he, he, said to me one, he said to me after one particular falling out, he said, I'll never speak to you again. And I just sat in the corner for a year and said nothing, and he never asked me a question. So my mother said, don't bother going there anymore. So I did read a lot of the child. She had taught me to read when I was quite young. And so I had a good knowledge of a lot of things that Irish people wouldn't have known about. Uh, and then when I came here, I continued that reading. I've read all my life. And then when I went to university later on over here, and um, I began thinking about painting. I, I, I was good at drawing. That was the other thing. I was quite good at drawing, even, even as a kid. I won quite a few small prizes and various things. And so uh, painting was something I, I fell back on. And you're originally from County Longford and you came to London many years ago. I left Longford during that great post-war exodus. I think about 800,000 people left in the space of 20 years. And I, we had a small shop in country town and um, as our customers left, we had to follow them. And that's followed into your, work, into your current work as well, Absolutely, isn't it? Yes. My pictures are imaginary pictures, or remembered pictures. And nobody chronicled uh, Ireland, uh, th these emigrants. They didn't want to know about emigrants. People disappeared. Uh, they, they left in their hundreds of thousands. And uh, some of them left because uh, Irish government or Irish people didn't want to pay taxes to keep them because they had no jobs. There were shortages of work. Some left because they'd been uh, involved in minor... Uh, mis mischiefs in Ireland, uh, uh, and they would say to the solicitor, uh, he's going to England in the morning, and they go to England, that would be the end of it. Uh, some of them left, uh, th there were a small number of middle class people who left who were doctors or engineers uh, who were produced out of the Irish university system. Um, and of course, priests and nuns in large numbers left and came over because that was their role as, uh, uh, I suppose, missionaries. And many, many Irish. Uh, uh, clerics often thought of the Irish migration as missionaries. They were coming over to set up a Catholic population and that there were prayers after Mass when I was an altar boy. Um, there used to be three Our Fathers and three Hail Marys for the conversion of England. Uh, I mean, all that's gone now. We're, that, that's all in the past. But at that time, there was all kinds of fantasies uh, in Ireland about uh, what was going to happen. But the real uh, thing that happened was ordinary people, men and women, uh, came to uh, badly educated um, uh, poorly skilled, uh, especially the men, and went down a hole in the ground. That's, uh, they, they dug holes in the ground and they worked uh, in all parts of England and they had no experience of, of working in an industrial world. So if the boss asked them uh, to go uh, 40 miles up the M1 to a d deserted empty area, even if there was no accommodation for them, they'd go there because the boss asked them. But they, they really were tough men and I suppose uh, it's the Irish spirit and it's the can-do attitude that probably got them through. Well, listen, uh, I don't know whether it was attitude. I, I, it, you're right, it is attitude. I mean, certainly the gender divide in Ireland in the 1950s was very acute. And men liked to be hard men. They liked to be tough. And uh, while girls were the caring figures, they were the ones who were going to pass down the religion. They were going to be the ones who looked after the elderly and the young. And so the Irish man went out and did uh, what, was, uh, what was necessary. So it wasn't that they, they wished to come over here. I don't think they had any choice. And uh, when you first came to the UK, um, what part of London did you settle in first? Or was it, well, as I you said, I, I, yeah. I went to and fro for a little, a little time, and then I finally came to London in 1965. I, I left when I was about coming just to my 16th birthday with my father, because both of us um, came at the same time. 
And then I went back to Ireland for a short time, worked in Dublin for a time, and then came back to London in 1965 and didn't work anymore on building sites. So I lived a totally different life then. I lived a, a life then as a painter and an artist and uh, an illustrator for magazines. I, I drew for a lot of the underground press. Tell, tell us about some of those magazines. Well, at that time there was, there was a bit of a revolution in the print world and offset lights are meant that people could print magazines for the first time very cheaply. And therefore, there was a, a tremendous um, 1960s swinging London world of protest and uh, magazines which qu questioned things. And of course, there was a great sexual and music revolution of the 1960s. And all of that produced articles, and I illustrated most of them. And that, that meant I had to read about them. And I read about them, and uh, uh, there were articles on sociology, articles on uh, changing attitudes to psychology, all kinds of things. And I drew, my, I drew pa pictures for them, and uh, it launched me in a, way, in, a, in a way of thinking about intellectual pictures and not just thinking of portraits or uh, scenes of London life. I actually drew images that actually expressed something that people were thinking about in their articles. Bernard, if people want to find out more about your work, is there a website they can log on to and maybe purchase some of your work? Yes, um, um, just uh, Google Bernard Canavan, or the Barbara Stanley Gallery in London, who, who represent my work in, in London, or indeed Tom Kenny, uh, his gallery in Galway. Um, I all usually have exhibitions over there, and I, I'm scheduled, uh, maybe even some of these I'll bring over to Galway. We're going to take a break right now, but do come back to us for the second half of the show. You're very welcome back to the show. Some of the most talented traditional Irish musicians came here to London in the 1950s and indeed the decades since then. A brand new CD compilation has just been compiled by Dr. Reg Hall, which features some very rare recordings of some of those artists. We joined Reg for the launch night. <laughs> The thing about Irish music is it's ephemeral and anything can happen and even on a day, a, a dull session, it can be exciting. And I, there was a time I played with Jim Power in the favourite five sessions a week with Tony Ledwith on the accordion, me on the piano and Jim Power on the fiddle. And we more or less played the same repertory of tunes, started with the same pair of tunes each session, except each session was different. It had a different atmosphere. The audience, the crowd was different. And uh, uh, every now and then it, you just, wow, it was marvellous. Uh, all sorts of musicians might come in. Um, it's it's uh, hard to pick out one session from another. Jim, uh, Paddy Malin, my great friend on the accordion, who's from Longford, and he had a lovely sort of gentle personality. And you'd meet him and I'd say, it was good last night, wasn't it? Oh, I was the best ever, because every session for Paddy Malin was the best ever. things about the Irish music is that all that stuff in the 50s, very little of it got recorded, almost nobody ever took a photograph and it always just been lost in thin air. 
So I thought I've really got to dig into this and I hunted round and, and found what recordings I could. People had cassette recordings, reel-to-reel recordings. The odd commercial record where the record company had gone bust and we could actually uh, use the recording. Um, and so that I just had a whole selection of material. with 200 performances to go on the six CDs, which last for seven and a half hours. But it's only, a, it's only the tip of the iceberg. I actually could only edit from the material that was available. And uh, for example, there's not one example of an old time waltz because people don't play old time waltzes on tapes. They only play them in dance halls. And some of the most exciting Irish music is a good old Cayley band and everybody, you know, 200 couples dancing around. Very exciting. But nobody thought to record that. And when they, they go around singing, you know, even it's a song like uh, One Fair County in Ireland, you know, all the girls singing the song going around in the dance hall. Wonderful. <laughs> was Sean O'Shea and John both fiddle and accordion. They played around Fulham. Now, they're both well-known musicians. They've both got great reputations. Where's the recordings? I asked John and I asked Sean. Neither have got any recordings. There might be some somewhere, um, and, but that's all lost to history. It's, it's just lost up in the air, gone up in smoke. <laughs> We've packaged the CDs into two collections of three CDs with a booklet, about a hundred page booklet with each one, and I've tried to focus on the people. I've tried to tell their biographies 
and tell their stories. And that's really what I've been trying to do all the time. One is called It Was Mighty. Now, the reason it's called It Was Mighty, well, that's a great Irish expression. But uh, the flute player, Gabe Sullivan, was talking about the 50s, and uh, he summed it up on It Was Mighty. So that's the history of Irish. The early, that's the early days of Irish music in London, 50s, 60s. And then the follow-up, was I was looking for another expression like it was mighty and I thought oh, it's great altogether because everybody says that what was it like last night ah it was great altogether so that is the follow-up and that's the continuation of the tradition and that goes up more or less to the 80s except the last CD is the present day but around about 1970 1980 things began to alter people died people went back um, and there was all sorts of new things came into Irish music and new sorts of Irish music which don't interest me at all. Except there's this thread of tradition that goes through it and you've got people like James Carty who plays the old music. He's got all the old attitudes. He's a modern man but he plays and I played with his dad 40 years ago and now I play with him. And uh, it's just a great pleasure and a great honour. I hope you're all going to buy the records. You can get them straight from Topic, and that's topicrecords.co.uk. What a great night we've had with Reg, and it really was great to see such a wealth of talent on stage. If you'd like to contact the show, send an email to ian at irishtv.ie, and you can also find us on Facebook and on Twitter. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have right now, but do come back to us next week when we'll be out and about in the UK. Mm -hmm.